All right. <clears throat> this is our third uh, lecture in the fetal circulation. And up to this point, we talked about the structures of and development of the fetus, uh, the placenta, the umbilical cord, how the placenta acts as the respiratory system, digestive system, urinary system, that blood flowing back from the placenta through the umbilical cord is rich, rich, rich in oxygen and nutrients and all those good things. <clears throat> the goal of fetal circulation is to route that good blood, that oxygenated, neutrified blood from the placenta and to the uh, most necessary parts of the body, which are the development of the brain. The brain, as you would know, is your personality, it's your intelligence, it's who you are as a human being. So the development of that is critical. And we see that because the upper part of the fetal body grows faster than the rest of the body. And part of that is due to this pattern of circulation. Um, and and part of this, part of the problem here is the good blood is in the venous system, kind of like it would be in the pulmonary circuit. But <clears throat> instead of being in an isolated circuit, this umbilical blood, this good blood, needs to flow into the systemic veins like the inferior vena cava and circulate um, in some way through all of the various tubes and chambers and heart and somehow get to the brain in the best quality that it can. In the second lecture, we saw how the ductus venosus allowed blood to bypass the capillaries of the liver and in a detour way, jump over into the inferior vena cava. Because otherwise, the umbilical blood would pass through the capillaries of the liver. And of course, anytime you go through capillaries, exchanges are made and all the richness of that special blood would be absorbed by the cellular structure of the liver. So let's, uh, let's describe our second reroute now. There's a second place where blood is going to take an abnormal direction, but for the benefit of fetal circulation. The problem is, is this. The umbilical blood in the inferior vena cava, and we saw it's now there because it's bypass the liver with a ductus venosus, and that is flowing toward the right atrium. But at the same time, another very large quantity of blood is flowing down to the right atrium as well, and that's all the superior vena cava blood. And of course, it's coming from the largest part of the body, the head and shoulders and arms, all of this upper portion of the body, and so we've got a real problem here. The uh, mixing of these two large quantities of blood in the right atrium could decrease the quality of blood, this umbilical blood, so that it becomes so dilute it's not much good for anything. So the, the problem is here in the heart. And the potentially enormous dilution here <clears throat> is the big problem. The deoxygenated blood from the superior vena cava poses a real problem for our umbilical blood. So how are we going to deal with that? How do we get around that? Um, when you look at the right atrium, it looks like these two bloods should mix. Um, if you look at the diagram here, you see the crisscrossing of the blood flow from the superior and inferior vena cava. There should be a slamming together of these two different and mixing of these two different types of blood. But in reality, there's only a minor dilution. Now, how could that be? What is that that allows for that? The answer is in our second reroute, this second bypass is called the foramen ovale. And <clears throat> you can see that the arrow from the inferior vena cava points through that opening and into the left atrium. And that actually is what's happening. The inferior vena cava blood is routed from the right atrium to the left atrium. And so this foramen ovale is our second 
bypass. <clears throat> if you follow the inferior vena cava blood and the superior vena cava blood at this point, you understand what is happening. The inferior vena cava routed to the left. The superior vena cava, if you follow the arrows, moves into the right atrium, but down through the, um, the valve and into the right ventricle. You can see that there's a color change here as that blue deoxygenated blood flowing down from the superior vena cava catches some of the oxygen from the inferior vena cava blood and moves on through. I think the real problem is when you look at a picture like this, how could the two possibly miss each other? Um, in this picture, obviously, the two uh, arrows are crisscrossing one another, and it's just kind of impossible to think, how would that happen? But it does. And at this point, you just simply need to um, believe me, if you follow the blood flow of these two and you see them crisscross, you either just have to take it by faith when I say the blood from the inferior vena cava is going to cross over and it's not going to thoroughly mix with the superior vena cava. So you can take that or I am going to go on for a few more minutes and describe how this actually occurs and how the two bloods don't meet. So if you need further understanding here, then um, you want to follow along. Otherwise, just know that there is this hole between the two atria and that the inferior vena cava blood is directed in such a way that it jumps to the left. But if that isn't good enough for you, follow along here. <clears throat> and here's the big problem. I've pointed out the foramen ovale there. You can see the crisscrossing apparently of the blood. Um, but they do not cross like you see in the picture. And here's the deal. The inferior vena cava is misplaced in the picture. And it's kind of an odd thing, but basically, I don't know if one artist caught from one textbook copies another, but almost every textbook that I've looked at really does misplace this. As you can see, they've put the inferior vena cava way, way over in the right side of the right atrium. Where does the inferior vena cava actually enter the right atrium? Now, if you think back to our heart dissection from uh, two weeks ago, you might be able to remember this. Is it on the outside, like all the pictures show, or is it near the center? Here's a picture of the posterior side of the heart. The inferior vena cava is here. Is it out to the right-hand side? Absolutely not. It's dead center. And if you remember our dissection of the heart, you'll remember that, that that inferior vena cava, we found the superior above and slightly to the right-hand side. But when we went looking for inferior vena cava, it was right over next to the left atrium and very much central in the heart. And this is the answer to the whole thing. The blood does not crisscross like most diagrams show, but the blood enters very close to the foramen ovale. The inner atrial septum is the name of the wall that is between there. You probably remember the um, interventricular septum when we were studying the heart at the beginning. Um, interatrial septum is the wall between the two, and the foramen ovale is in that wall. Let's describe this foramen ovale in a little more detail. Here's a simple picture where the AV in the picture represents the left atrium, the AH represents the right atrium, and notice how the, t the wall between the two, the the inner atrial septum is not a single wall. It doesn't develop as a single wall. It actually develops in two pieces, one that grows up from the bottom like this and one that grows down from the top. Before they meet, there's a gaping hole between the two atria. But the longer this grows, the more and more 
um, it becomes more of a tube-like structure. Um, in the picture of the heart here, if I put those two in like you see them there, <clears throat> let's put the opening for the inferior vena cava in our little pencil diagram there. And then, of course, this is how blood from the inferior vena cava moves right through that opening, or here. The inferior vena cava is aimed right at that opening. So the foramen ovale um, is not, uh, the foramen ovale is in the center, but the inferior vena cava is right next to it. Um, this picture here that I added um, does show, still shows the inferior vena cava too far off to the right. The um, actual structure, if we were to draw it in, would look more like this, like a tube. Um, and the longer the walls grow, the more and more of a tube-like structure it is. And that's how that blood then just comes right up and over. And instead of really flowing into the right atrium, it's take, taking this detour and flowing then over into the left. And that's the purpose of this foramen ovale. While the inferior vena cava blood is moving through the foramen ovale, the superior vena cava blood is doing this and flowing down on the ventricle. Maybe you can see how tough it would be for that superior vena cava blood to kind of make a U-turn to try and go up through that foramen ovale. Um, but inasmuch as most of that blood gets over there freely, you can see how there's going to be some mixing. There is a gap between the inferior vena cava and the foramen ovale. And so some of that oxygenated blood is going to mix with the deoxygenated blood of the superior vena cava. And so the superior vena cava blood is somewhat enriched by this exchange. Um, probably want to describe this movement as more of a side swipe where the blood coming up, and I've kind of put that inferior vena cava closer to the middle, and the blood coming down are really sort of side swiping each other. It's not a head on collision. And so that inferior or that superior vena cava blood is going to pick up some oxygen as it goes. In the coloration here, you can see that the blue deoxygenated blood, as it passes into the right ventricle, um, becomes more of a purple color, uh, meaning that it's taken on some of the red oxygenation to it. Not as fully as the blood flowing over into the left atrium, but there is some addition of oxygen to that blood, and that's a good thing. The superior vena cava blood needs to be enriched. Otherwise, what would the lungs do? And again, you know the right-hand side of the heart. The blood from the right ventricle is going to flow over to the two lungs. But the two lungs have no access to oxygen. We are not breathing when we're in the womb. So the lungs are relying on oxygenated blood in order to grow and develop. And if all they were pumping was deoxygenated blood that had returned from the superior vena cava, they'd be in big trouble. So the addition of some oxygen from the inferior vena cava blood, from that umbilical enriched blood, that being added somewhat to the superior vena cava blood is going to help give some oxygen than to the lungs. So that's a good thing. But still, the richness of the blood puts the richest blood over into the left um, atrium. Okay? So now, <clears throat> blood in the left atrium then, this rich blood is going to go down into the left ventricle, as in normal circulation. Left ventricle is going to pump it up into the aortic arch. And of course, what is there at the aortic arch? three major blood vessels, two of which lead directly to the brain. So those branches then are going to feed blood right up and to the brain. So that's, that really is, in a nutshell, in these two lectures, we've seen how a ductus venosus at the liver and a foramen ovale in the heart have allowed the blood to sort of sidestep 
the, the deoxygenated blood or mix with a smaller amount and really get a pretty high quality blood. Not perfect, it's been diluted a couple of times, but in a minor way, but getting it over to the left atrium and then on its way to the brain. And that's the biggie here. So just to summarize this, the inferior vena cava blood that's rich, that has all that umbilical nutrition and oxygen in it, is detoured to the left side of the heart through the foramen ovale from the inferior vena cava. And that blood then travels the left side of the heart up the aortic arch to the brain. While the superior vena cava blood does pick up some oxygen in the right atrium. And the right ventricle then pumps blood that is fairly low in oxygen, but still there's oxygen there. And that blood is then pumped to the lungs. So the lungs that need some oxygen and some nutrition in order to grow and develop get what they need as well. So there is the third lecture, the second major reroute, the foramen ovale. So at this point, you should know and understand the ductus venosus, and now you should know and understand the foramen ovale.